So yeah, hi everyone. Um, my name is Elmer Kölzer. Um, I'm from Munich. Did we hit record on Twitter? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm from Munich and I'm uh, working for Samantis. I'm partner and engineer there. We are building um, business to business enterprise applications. And I'm also working on server side and client side stuff. So on server side, it's mostly JVM. And on the client side, it's browser and iOS. And today, I want to talk about dependency injection for iOS applications based on reader and co-reader. And my presentation is split into three parts. It's like the golden circle. There's the why part, the how part, and the what part. And also, there will be some playground examples at the end. And then I hope that should everything wrap together. First of all, why even care about dependency injection? So my personal motivation is always just testing. And that's especially the case when there are co-effects in your code, which means that every code that talks to the network, every time you create a date, every time you persist data, or whatever you think about, it's just talking to the outer world. So, and you can't control the outer world. But in order to trust your tests, you actually want to control these parts, which means you must be able to substitute those parts, and you have to control the outer world. It's easier said than done. There is no official guideline how to implement dependency injection for iOS applications. And um, it's, it's hard in the beginning to start from. Um, and also, when, you, when you're looking for your own solution, you better make sure that you don't end up in a dead end. So like after four months, and you suddenly see that it's not possible to do the things you want to do. Also, you have to make sure that writing tests is actually fun, because that's the most important pun, uh, fun, uh, part. When you, when you have to write tests, and it's like 60% ceremonial code, you ain't going to write tests. And also, you have to make sure that after a couple of months, the whole concept still makes sense. Um, and it's not like having to read again documentation, documentation, in order to understand how you inject the different values, et cetera. And so I personally, I, wanna, I wanted to have a, like a clear pattern on how to solve that. And for the start, let's have a look at a common setup. So my guess for the most popular form of dependency injection, um, it's, it's some form of constructor injection, which means that you have a class or a type or whatever. You're passing in types conforming to a protocol, and then you store them, and then you use them. Um, it's highly flexible, of course, because you can do whatever you want to do. And there's just one condition, bring it to the initializer. But also, it may lead to lots of boilerplate code. And you need to make sure to orchestrate all those dependencies for all your parts of your application. And at the end, in my opinion, it's just too error prone to use. And before I go to the next slide, I want to separate two steps conceptually, which you already see. There's step one, pass on, which means that you're providing to someone a value that knows how to do something. And there's one important question, who actually passed them on to me? And the second step is keep it. So having access to one or many of those things. And the important question is, when someone else gave them to me and stored them, why do I have to store them again? So keep these steps in mind for later, and I hope to take them to the extreme. So let's go back to your decision to write testable code, and you end up with three possible solutions. Either you do it manually, like the approach before, or you choose um, an existing dependency injection framework. So you will find a couple of them on GitHub. And um, like I said, I've been working on the server side for a couple of years, and I have experience with Spring, et cetera. And I was, just, I was too afraid to use any form of dependency injection framework because I, I feel that the complexity is just too much. And so that's why the only option left was to do something else. And let's talk about something else. And this is a functional conference, so let's talk about functional programming. And in my experience, it's, it's where like opinions are divided. So some people like it, some people don't like it. It's like weird names for weird concepts. And, and then people also say like Swift is not a functional programming language. 
So when you compare it to, for example, Haskell, where everything is about purity, laziness, referential transparency, and no side effects at all, you can't say that about Swift. So then the reason is, why, why should I go a functional way when, when it's not really a functional programming language? Well, the fir first thing is you can actually force yourself to write functional code. And furthermore, when you look very closely, you can actually see that Swift itself uses or sometimes even forces lots of functional patterns. So that's just some examples. So we have here monads, we have here co unida loop fusion, and we have Kleisley arrows. So they are all concepts which are basically category theory, and you can read papers about them. But Swift basically makes them like syntax sugars or properties. So the, the first example with a value, the first three lines, you actually see a property, a, a type value with an optional property string. And the, the, the variable value, which is, again, optional itself, and by using value question mark dot string, which is just like syntax sugar, you're actually performing a flat map on the maybe monad. So that's one concept. The other one is when we have a list like one, two, three, and we take the lazy property, and then we do three times a map. What's actually happening is that it's, uh, so to say, an isomorphic functor, which just composes those map functions into a single loop. So again, that's just like a, a really complicated concept, co unida, uh, brought into like syntax sugar. And then, of course, the new thing since with four key paths, and now also with the option to use question marks for key paths, which means that you basically define a path to a property and you're going over optionals. So that's, that's the so-called Kleisley category. It's basically composition of flat map operations, and then you apply them to a value. And people don't think about that when they, when they just type that thing. And that's, for me, it's, I, would, I would claim it's suspicious. So when a language uses so many functional concepts and steals them from functional programming, maybe it's not a bad idea at all to look into functional programming for uh, using something like uh, dependency injection. So functional programming, dependency injection, we bring it together. And now I want you to remember those two steps we had before. Step one, pass on. Step two, keep it. We will look at them step by step, and then we can see how we can transport them, uh, trans transform them into functional programming. Step one, read a monad. So the official Haskell documentation says, it represents a computation which can read values from a shared environment, pass values from function to function, and execute subcomputations in a modified environment. Um, well, that's hard for me to figure out what I can actually do with it. So let's have a look on, on, a, on a Swift implementation. So the reader, which is a monadic type, is nothing else than just a wrapper for a function. The function is called f. And we have a value of type E, which you could say as the environment. And you get in return a value of type A, which is the answer or what you ask for. So that's basically all. You have just the function, which is wrapped away. And, and then you have a couple of methods. And there's, for example, a unit. And the unit function, you pass in a value A. And no matter what kind of E you pass in, you will always get that value A back. So it's just. It will, always be, it will always be there, no matter what you pass in. Then there's the run function, which actually applies an E to the function we stored. So then you get an actual A back. Then, of course, reader as a monadic type is a functor, so we can map over this result. And as always, it's not executed immediately, but it's, it's a new reader we return, which itself will apply the new function G to the result of the first function. And then, I guess the, or at least for me, the most complicated concept was finding flat map for reader. That's, and that's a, it's a weird situation, because you have, to, you have to think about that. You basically have a function which takes an E and returns an A. And afterwards, you have another function which takes that A and depends on an E to get another, another value. So that's actually the chain. So you, you compose functions which all depend on a value e, but they all need the value from, uh, from the previous calculation. And 
again, that's, that's, that's a simple implementation, but it's very abstract. So how does it look like in the easiest way? We start with a bunch of type aliases. So there's one type alias called calculation, which is a binary function from integer, integer to integer. And then we have a type alias any calculation, which is a function that takes an integer and returns a function that takes an integer and returns a reader calculation integer. So the second type alias is more or less just a function that creates a function which can be used as a flat map. So the reader itself waits for a function. It waits for this function which takes two integers and returns an integer. And then at the end it will return an integer. What can we build out of it? The any calculation has one simple implementation in that case. So it's just a, a queried reader. We pass an A, and we take that A we pass in as the first argument, as the second argument to the calculation. And then the, res the, the B, which will be provided from, from a, a previous a reader flat map call, will be passed in as the first argument to the calculation. But they are all wrapped inside a reader which waits for the calculation. And the next, the next line is, uh, it's unfair because you don't see the code, but it's, it's nothing else than a composition of flat map methods. So as the reader is a monadic type, there is some form of Kleisley category which allows you to compose binding or flat map operations. So by calling calculate with a number, we actually create flat map methods which we then can compose. That means I'm setting up a calculation which takes 10, then afterwards that calculation will be passed on to something that takes 5, that afterwards will take something with 2. At the end, we have to actually execute it. So we're starting a reader and we pass in 100. And then we call flat map on the calculation, on the operation, which is just like a composed flat map. So at the end, nothing nothing happened, but once we pass in a function to the run method, we actually see the result. So when I'm passing in plus, it takes the 100, and then calls 100 plus 10, then it calls the result of 100 plus 10, adds five, and then it adds two. The same when I'm, when I'm using multiply, minus, or division. So the, 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 the concept of the calculation is completely abstract, but I'm, I'm telling the operation what it should basically do. So that's step one. Step two, keeping it. Um, of course, keeping it is the opposite of passing on. So we have to look at the categorically dual of the reader monad, which is the co-reader monad, or the co-reader co-monad, or the co-reader. So it turns out all we need to do, we just need to add the uh, prefix co, and as the people say in Haskell, we just have to flip the arrows. That's basically all, and we're done or like the people on the documentation say, in more technical language, the reader co-monad is the left adjoint to the reader monad. So if you're into this, there are lots of papers about adjunctions, and I'm not gonna talk about that. We wanna see the Swift implementation. So just like the reader, which was generic to E and A, but basically had a function inside, the co-reader has also two generics, it's E and A. But the huge difference is that both are existing. So there is the value we ask for A, and there is the environment E. So we have access to both. Um, Comonetic types um, have different operations than monadic types. Um, the, at the end, the most important part is uh, the extract method, which basically takes the value R we ask for and just returns it. So it's, it's super easy to get out of a common app because you can just call extract and it gives you the value. Um, of course, co-readers are functors again. So we can take a function from A to B and then we can create a new co-reader and just take the A, apply it to F and pass on the same environment again. So it doesn't look too complicated. Um, duplicate in terms of the co-reader, the duplicate part is, uh, is also very simple. So when you see at the, in the signature, it takes a co-reader EA and returns a co-reader which has the co-reader in itself. So it's basically, it's duplicating the structure. Um, 
again, the, the implementation is super simple. Um, and then the, the method, which is, so to say, the opposite of the flat map is the extent. So when you look at the signature, it says co-reader EA to B. So where you have a flat map operation, which goes to, from A to, for example, optional B, it's just flipped. So you get the whole co-reader and get something out of it. So its implementation is basically just the duplicate and afterwards mapping with a function that takes the co-reader and returns the value. Again, what do you get from it? So we start again with some type aliases. There's the type alias nfa, which is just a, a co-reader where we pin um, the environment to protocol world. And again, you don't see the implementation for that protocol. It's just like a world has uh, an API, and the API has a server, and the server has a time, just for, for the example. Then we have a type alias called access. So access is uh, the same signature as the extent method. So we get an environment A and get a B from it. And just like you could compose flat map operations and call them to, and, 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 and compose them and stack them together, you can stack extent methods. And where the flat map was, was uh, basically the Kleisley composition, that's the so-called co Kleisley composition, of course. And again, the implementation for the co Kleisley at that point is, um, in that particular case, I did it just with uh, key paths because the co-reader just had two properties. And for the example, basically, we just take one of those values. So in the first case, we take the API, and then we put the API into the co-reader. And we have the whole environment again. And afterwards, we just take the ask server time and store that again in the co-reader. What does it actually do? So we set up a real environment where we start with just void. And the environment is the real world, which is an impl uh, implementation of the world protocol. And when we take that real environment and extend it with a compose co-clicely of get time, we took the time from the real environment, put it into the co-reader, and once we call extract, we get the time out of it. So that could be today. For the mock environment, we start the same way, but we are using the mock world. We take the same co Kleisley composition, so it's the same path to go, but when we call extract, we get a different value. And that's, that's pretty cool. And so in, when, when you compare reader and co-reader, it's, it's basically monad, co-monad. So on the one hand, you have a flat map operation. On the other one, you have an extent operation. Uh, when you look at the Haskell signature, so you go from MA, which is your monad, then you have a function which goes from A to MB, and in return, you get an MB. So for the co-monad, it's MA, then MA to B, and then you get an MB. So you can just literally flip the arrows. Um, also, what, what helped me a lot to understand those concepts is that um, monads in the flat map, they consume first. So they consume the M, you get the A, and then they produce the MB. Whereas co-monads, they produce first. So you get an MA, then they consume that part and return the B. And of course, the most important part is composition. So we have Kleisley arrows and we have co-Kleisley arrows. Problem is, in terms of usability, is it really worth and does it, does it match up with iOS? So the reader, yeah, no one is holding you back. You can actually just take the reader and work with it. So it's, it's basically function composition and uh, 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 you can call them from everywhere. Problem is with the co-reader. So once you try to push a co-reader uh, with a few controller into a navigation controller, it will not work. So that means the core reader doesn't work, and which would make my whole presentation pointless. Um, but it turns out you don't need to implement the core reader in a way I did it. The easiest form of a core reader is a tuple, a tuple with two values. And you're just operating on the first value, and you keep track of the second value. So that's the reason. Um, why I try to find a way to implement the co-reader in a Swift style um, based on property and protocols. And as it acts like a co-reader, it should 
be called like a co-reader, so that's why it's called corridor. Like, <laughs> guess that makes sense. So, it's 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 actually like a, a micro framework which which can turn anything into a co-reader, and in conjunction or in, in, together with the reader, it basically helped me a lot to get full-fledged control over all those co-effects. And that's what I wanted to show now. So let's see. Turn around. Is that big enough? Okay, so um, that's the easiest example. So I have uh, three examples in total. Uh, the first one is the implementation for a uh, running um, application. And the most important part for me in terms of, of um, separating tests and app is that the app basically contains no code which is necessary for testing. Um, so all we do have here is we have a, a common protocol called app context, which defines that we need a date, which is called now. Next up, we have the implementation for that protocol, which is called default context, and it returns the actual date. Next up, there's, there are, basically there are three protocols in Corridor. One is the base protocol called has context, and then there are two um, protocols deriving from it. One is called has instance context, the other one is called has static context. So we have to extend the has context and define the context to be the app context. And then we are providing a property, which is called default, with the backticks, um, which is essentially just a resolver for the default context. So and now that's where the fun actually begins. So by using the protocol, anything that conforms to has instant context, where the context is app context, we provide a property called now. And that one will take the resolver and use the key path from the protocol to give me now. So the usage in a controller, for example, is that the controller implements the has instance context. We set the resolve property to default. And by using the backticks, it actually looks more like a config than like actual code. And voila, here's my now property, which means that uh, yeah, so the controller appears and it shows the current date. So that's my controller, and I don't want to change any code in it. So how do I test that, or how can I, can I modify the values for the test? So the way I use it is that all my test cases are also context aware, and they just have a different environment, which is a mock, or the mock context. So as the mock context is just another app context, it just extends the protocol, and I have control over the date, so I know exactly what date I'm passing in, which means that when I'm running the same controller, and this is again a function which uh, is provided by Corridor, which just sets a different um, environment, and I'm running and I'm showing that controller, I see that the date has changed. So that's fairly simple. But what can we actually do? in combination with the reader and the co-reader. So you have to stand with me. First parts again, here we define everything. So the context now has just another property, which is called API. And the API is nothing else than a wrapper type, which has a connection, and it basically gives you any type T for an URL. So that's, that's like a, a, your network connection. So when you call a certain URL, you are returning, uh, you get in return a certain type. So here we have the. Better. Okay. So then again, we have to we have to um, extend the, the the base protocol. So we're setting again the same app context and we're providing the same property. And then I'm taking a convenience protocol where I basically pin the context type to the app context. So now I can just use context aware everywhere. Um, 
that's, that's really a basic implementation for this API. So the API does nothing else than, like I said, it takes a string and gives you a future value from your network. So then here, I'm setting up everything I want to inject into the controllers. So I'm going to fake a reSwift store, so I have the possibility to dispatch messages. I have a now property, which will resolve now. I have an API, which will be resolved by the API. I have a dispatch me method, which just inserts into dispatch, and I have messages, which just reads out the messages. Next up, the interesting part, so the reader. Like you saw with the calculation example, you can compose a calculation, and in the same way, you can compose network requests. So I'm defining type aliases for a reader, which is waiting for an API in order to get a value O. So, and then I know that the value I'm going to get is a future of type O, and then I'm defining a type alias for the flat map. So that's the reader will have a future, and I'm going to bind that into a new re a reader with a, which will itself return a new future. The bind implementation looks like this. So we're always returning a new reader, where API aware is now the reader with the API. And then we're taking the previous future, which gets passed in from the flat map. And we just get the response, and we are taking that function in order to get the URL out of the endpoint or whatever we are getting here. So let's compose those entry or those, those endpoint API calls. Um, I have an entry, an entry point for the API, which is just a reader that will give me a future of an endpoint. And then from that endpoint, I can go to a user's endpoint. From the user's endpoint, I could go to a user endpoint, and then from the user endpoint to an address endpoint. So that's just like stacking network calls. And here again, that's the Kleisley composition. So I'm, I'm stacking those network calls into one big operation, but I'm not running them. So the actual implementation of the controller will take the API entry point, flat map on the composed API call, and afterwards run it with the injected API. So that means once that future, which is stored, or once that future which is stored into the reader is fulfilled, I can get the address out of the, out of the future. And then I'm just showing it. So in that case, the future is more or less just something which composes the string. So as you see, it just returns the URL. Um, and now when I'm taking the test and let it run with the test, it takes a different server. So it's, it's, I had no changes to made in the controller. It just worked. But there's one thing. What if I want to access, for example, in that API something which is another dependency? So I don't want to put something else in there because I would have to provide, again, more parameters. And that's exactly what we want to avoid. So it turns out the co-reader concept means that once I turn my API into something which is context aware, and again, I let it resolve to the default in the beginning, the API which will be injected to the controller turns into a co-reader, which means it has full access to everything from the context. So now I could go inside that network call, and I could just say api.dispatch. Uh, then I take the input. And then also I have the current time. Yeah. OK. So what that means is that 
while the API call is performed, I'm accessing another thing, which is the store in that, in that particular case. So I'm dispatching, and I want to know when did it happen. And as you see in the mock time and with the mock server, it's just displaying the different URLs that were called and always use the, the mock time. So now once I switch back to the original version, you basically see the, that it accesses the original time again and the original server for all subsequent calls. And, and that's, that's, at least for me, that was like a super easy way to, to construct all those things. And uh, where was it? And it delivered, for me, like an, a unified handling of dependency injection. Um, there's, there's no business code involved in your actual types. And the dependencies turned into transparent objects. They, they're just there as a property. And there's just one central thing which stores them and passes them on to you. Um, testing, as I said, is turned super simple because the test cases, they were just resolving to another um, um, context at that point. And in total, Less code, more safety. So um, I will post the gist for those code Kleisley and Kleisley arrows and everything uh, on my blog. And also, if you have time, check out Corridor on GitHub. And yeah, thanks. That's it. <laughs>